Have you ever felt like you were in a fog? <laughs> You're like daily, right now actually, still working on my third cup of coffee and hoping that fog's gonna clear. You know, we, we sometimes feel that way early in the morning, throughout the day. Perhaps it's because of circumstances, things going on in our lives. And I was thinking about that this week, about sort of the, the distinction between being in a fog and then sort of seeing clouds in the sky. I'm not a meteorologist, but I feel like there's probably some, some definite similarities between clouds and fog, just the way they're formed and all those things. I did take physical geography uh, in college, my freshman year at UT, I got a D and it was a lab class. That's four hours. You do the math. That's a, that's a GPA killer right there. Thought I was getting around biology and uh, turns out um, the professor was like, they were all on that game. And so, you know, they, were made, they made it really hard on us. So I don't really know the difference between clouds and fog, but I do know what I can see. And I can, I can see that when there are distinct clouds in the sky, you, know, you can look up, you can see the wind blowing those clouds. You can, you can see the direction of the weather and you kind of know where it's going. They have distinct shapes. Maybe you've played that game with your kids, you know, where it's like, hey, you know, you look up in the sky and you're like, look at that one. It looks like a, like a bunny riding on a sea turtle. Interesting story about this. I'm sitting out on my back porch yesterday kind of working on this and thinking through this, and, and I, was, I was sort of typing on my computer my notes and saying out loud just something random, like I need a random image of a cloud, and I, I just said, I made it up. I was like, just a bunny riding on a sea turtle, and I said it out loud, and I wrote it down in my notes, and then I, I went back later to did a Google image search for cloud shapes. <laughs> And I was like, I mean, my mind, I was like, my mind is blown. So either like the Holy Spirit of God is all over this, so buckle up and pay attention, or Google is listening to everything I say and monitoring everything on my computer. I mean, I like, no kidding, that is 100% the truth. I was just so blown away. And now look at that bunny riding on a sea turtle. But when you're in a fog, when you're in a fog, things are totally different. You don't know necessarily which direction you're going in. Your visibility is limited to just a few feet around you. You don't have that clarity. Objects are present, but details are fuzzy. It's easy to miss a turn or a landmark or really to know what's coming at you. When we were praying to launch this church over five years ago, when we were praying for this thing that it would become, we we're praying for the, the place and the people to which God was calling us, some of us were sensing the Spirit of God showing us a picture. It was a picture of where he was calling us to go. It was the landscape or the, the climate, if you will, into which he was calling us. By the way, that us was a little small core team that, that is now like this us. And we saw a picture of this area. It was you know, sort of the Udawa area, stretching all the way up to Cleveland, all the way down to Chattanooga. This area, you know, is always in the race for some pretty incredible superlatives, like most churched city in America. God's calling us to go plant a church in the most churched city in America. Or perhaps you've, you've heard of the most biblically minded city in America. These are some of the awards that you know, Chattanooga has received. There's lots of churches. There's lots of religious activity. There's a lot of conservative moral values. But the picture that we saw was this city in a fog, a religious haze. You know, when you're in a fog, you don't really see clearly. You don't know exactly where you're going. And it was in this picture that this haze was kind of a combination of big questions about future and faith, it's broken relationships, it's confusing circumstances, it's, it's all the church-related activity thrown in there and all the religious rituals and motions, and yet there wasn't clarity. There wasn't purpose. But most importantly, what we were sensing was that there wasn't the power in the personal relationship with the Holy Spirit of God. 
I read someone write it in their personal story this week. Chris announced our new members earlier in the service. And as a part of that process, everyone writes out their story. And it's one of my favorite things to do here. I read this this past week. I grew up going to church. In elementary school, I prayed to receive Christ and professed my faith in him. Unfortunately, for many years, I lived like there was little more to following Christ. All there was to do was try to sin as little as possible, conceal whatever sin was present in my life so as not to disappoint God or my family, and hold on to heaven someday. Can anybody relate to that? That's the fog. It's quite different from the guidance and the presence of God that Chris talked about last week when we kicked off this conversation. We talked about God leading the Israelites through the wilderness with a distinct cloud. There was a cloud there that came and the wind would blow and it would go and it would lead them and they knew where God was going by the daytime and then at night there was this bright pillar of fire. We talked about how God would lead and protect his people back then and how now he's given us his very Holy Spirit, to guide and be with us today. But for many of us, we don't experience that kind of clarity. Perhaps it's because maybe unknowingly we've been walking around in a sort of churchy religious fog. That's why we say we, we came. God called us here for those who have given up on church but Maybe not on God. But also, it explains why you might be fine with church and still feel far from God. We make assumptions like Christianity is just an insurance policy to keep us out of hell. You know, we walk the aisle, we pray the prayer, we go through those motions, we check that box, but is that it? Or we make assumptions like we have to hide our sin. We gotta clean ourselves up. We gotta get it all together and then, you know, and then participate in this church thing. It reminded me of a song by Miranda Lambert. You may know that country song. Uh, she says, it doesn't matter how you feel. It only matters how you look. Go and fix your makeup, girl. It's just a breakup. Run and hide your crazy and start acting like a lady. You know this one? Because <laughs> I raised you better. Gotta keep it all together even when you fall apart. Foggy Christian life is just go to church on Sunday and hope for the best. Maybe add a little more activity if you find yourself in a tight spot. But what we long for, what we long for is the kind of relationship with God that cuts through all that fog. And it gives us clarity of purpose and direction What we long for is a type of family and friendship that's deeper and more profound than perhaps what we've had. What we long for is the kind of real-time, dynamic closeness of or connection with God that the Bible describes that perhaps we've heard other people talk about, but we haven't experienced ourselves. Here's how another one of your stories said it this week. I don't really know how to explain it except to say that I've felt a stirring in my heart for a while now that maybe there's more to this life than just what I grew up believing. I mean, I was raised in church, but I never really felt anything. I believe God has been working on my heart for a long time. Pretty amazing how he never gives up on you. I think he's been nudging me to do things. Can you just sort of sense the awakening here? For example, I never wanted to be in a small group, and then I signed up for one a little reluctantly at Two Rivers. And I believe he's used those relationships, get this, to help me see him and get to know him and to grow in my faith and to show me there was nothing to be afraid of. See, that's what I'm talking about. That's what we want. That's what I want. That's what you want. So the question is, how do we get that? We're in a conversation about the Holy Spirit because he is the answer. Not it is the answer, but he is the answer because he is 
a person, not some impersonal force. We're not trying to figure out how to use our lightsabers here. It's a person that we can build a relationship with. And he can lead us out of the religious fog into something deeper and richer and so much more satisfying. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to the book of 2 Corinthians. Dial it up on your smartphone. 2 Corinthians, we're going to be in chapter 13 for just a second because I want to introduce you to one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And if you like to highlight or underline in your Bible or on your, on your Bible app, on your phone, I, I highly recommend this verse. And it's interesting because I'm actually starting this morning with the way the Apostle Paul ended. We're gonna look at the very last sentence of his letter that we have called 2 Corinthians. Chapter 13, verse 14. The Apostle Paul concludes his letter to his friends saying, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I love everything that's packed into that one sentence, that one line that is just sort of a benediction or a blessing or a sort of a, a farewell at the end of his letter. But, but it says everything that we need It says everything about our triune God, God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all the things that we can enjoy in relationship with him. But I wanna focus on that phrase, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That word fellowship is a Greek word. If you've been around church, you might've heard this thrown around, koinonia. It's a pretty famous churchy Greek word. It means a communion, a close association with, a sharing. It's talking about a give and take kind of participation. That's the kind of connection it's talking about. And it's deeper than an acquaintance. There's a a sharing of experience and life and story that's kind of hard to put into words, but it makes me think of the fellowship of the ring. You know, J.R.R. Tolkien's the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I think about these companions. If you've read the story or seen the movie, these companions are, are on a journey. They're on a mission to destroy the Ring of Doom and their struggles and their victories and everything that happens to them along the way are just so intertwined and interconnected and shared. There is truly fellowship there. It reminds me of of that game, maybe you've played this with, with people before, you know, like you, you put your hands like this and you cross, you interlock your fingers and then you bring them up like this and then, you know, someone points to a finger and you try to figure out how to move it and it's really hard to do. You're gonna try this now, later, I recommend it and uh, have someone point to a finger and then you try to move it and you see how hard it is because they're so interconnected that it's really hard to tell what's what. That's what this, this fellowship is, this koinonia means that there's something in common that is, that is deep. I love how authors John Eldridge and Brent Curtis put this in the Sacred Romance, their book. They write, the deepest part of our heart longs to be bound together in some heroic purpose with others of like mind and spirit. Isn't that great? Doesn't that describe that journey? It describes the fellowship that Paul's talking about. It's a fellowship, a sharing, a partnership that we have with the spirit of God that lives within all those who have turned and put their faith in Christ. And it's a fellowship that we all share together, all of us who have put our faith in Christ. We have that same type of bond, that same connection, bound together in a heroic purpose with others of like mind and spirit. May the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, what's at the heart of this journey with the Spirit? Well, if we flip back a few chapters, still in 2 Corinthians, and we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul's going to lay this out for us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 16, Paul says this, But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now, here's what Paul's talking about. I need to set up a little bit of context here because you're like, okay, we just jumped right into the middle of this passage here. 
Paul is talking about something that was happening back in Exodus, back with Moses. When Moses would go and meet with God and be in the presence of God, it was so incredible that when he would come out and go and meet with the people and relay the message to them, whether it was the, the Ten Commandments and you know on the tablets of stone or just meeting with him in the tent of meeting and then coming out and telling them, here's what I've heard God say. It was so intense that his face would be just like radiant. It would just be glowing. You know, the Psalms talk about this. Psalm 34, 5 talks about how when we meet with God, when we're in his presence, our faces are radiant. We never have to be ashamed of that. But, but here in this situation in Exodus, Moses would come out. They would see his face glowing. They would know he had met with the Lord, but that glow would fade. Sort of represented or symbolized the fact that this, this old covenant that God was making with his people wasn't going to last forever and that glory would fade. And so Moses would put a veil over his face so that they wouldn't see that fading glory. But also, it kind of represented the fact that their hearts were so hard and, and sinful that, that they, they couldn't really grasp or see the full glory of God. But now the apostle Paul takes that and he says, but when one turns to the Lord, when we turn to Jesus Christ, that veil that sort of covers God's glory, it's removed. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, we sang this earlier, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face behold the glory of the Lord. We, we can see the glory of the Lord because we don't have that veil or that separation of that hardness of heart anymore, that, that separation that sin causes us between us and God. Now that veil, that barrier has been removed. We can see God for who he is. And he says we're being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So Paul's saying the spirit of the Lord gives freedom to follow God's commands. The spirit of the Lord gives freedom from slavery to sin. The spirit of the Lord gives freedom from spiritual blindness. So through our faith in Christ, that, that barrier, it's taken away and now we can see Jesus for how beautiful he is. As a treasured possession. As a pearl of great price, Jesus would describe the kingdom of God like that. We see Jesus that way. We see how much we need him. We see how, in, how incredible his grace and mercy and love is for us. And we behold him in that radiance and wisdom and glory and power. And then we don't just, just kind of gaze on it and go, wow, isn't that cool? But we're actually being transformed and changed more into that same image. In other words, we're becoming more like Jesus. See, that's what the Spirit's trying to do. What, that's what this fellowship with the Spirit is all about. It's about making us more like Jesus. The fellowship of the Spirit is moving us from one degree to the next that's our journey. That's the growth that we're on. That's, that's if you've been walking with Jesus for a little while now, that's perhaps you felt that. Maybe you're a relatively new believer and, and you're already seeing some of that transformation taking place. He's changing the way you think. He's changing the way you make choices. This is one of the most important things about our stories. It's about who we are becoming. Right now, Christy Primus is our kids director and she's meeting with seven families who are gonna be dedicating their children to the Lord next week on Mother's Day. And she's telling them that on this journey, there are gonna be all kinds of questions and decisions about what your child will do, right? Like, will he play soccer? Will she do ballet? Will he do well in school? Are we gonna do homeschool, public school, private school? All kinds of decisions that are gonna be made about, about what we're going to do. But more important than all of those things is who do we pray this child will become a believer in Jesus Christ? A man who is patient and kind and humble. A woman who is pure and strong in her convictions. We're becoming more like Jesus through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So it kind of begs a question. How do I have fellowship with the Holy Spirit? 
How does this work? Because I want that. You know, that's what I want. I want in on that. Well, by its very definition, the fellowship involves both of us participating. That's what that koinonia means. So the spirit is bringing freedom to our lives and transforming us, making us more like Jesus. What's our part? What's my part? Well, we can turn to Paul's letter to the Galatians. In Galatians 5, verse 25, Paul says this. If we live by the Spirit, let's also keep in step with the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. That verb there, stoicheo, keep in step with. It's a military term. It means to proceed in a row as a march of a soldier. And that's a pretty important picture because just a few sentences earlier, Paul's describing a battle. He's describing a battle in Galatians 5, verse 17. He says, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Have you felt that battle before? Can I get an amen? We sense that. We, we, we've experienced that battle inside of us and that's the Holy Spirit fighting back those desires of our flesh, those, those broken, sinful things that, that, that over time, the Spirit of God is overcoming and making us more like Jesus because our flesh is sinful. It's greedy. It's self-absorbed and destructive, or at least mine is. And the Spirit's leading the way in the fight. And if he's out front, we just need to keep in step with him. We need to follow the leader. We need to watch what he's doing and we need to imitate. And here's how he's gonna do it. He's gonna bring scriptures to our minds when we're in that battle. He's gonna remind us of how strong he is and how we just need to lean into his strength. He's gonna remind us of what is, of what is wrong and what is right. That's called conviction. Jesus talked about that in the Gospel of John. He said, this is what the Holy Spirit's gonna come and do. It's gonna convict the world of sin. We're all of a sudden gonna be cut to our core and we're gonna know, oh, that's not good. Oh, that is not what God wants for our lives. That, oh, that's against God's commands and his will. And we'll begin to, to feel convicted about that when we follow the Spirit's lead and we defeat those desires of the flesh, we begin to experience the fullness of the fruit of the Spirit. And all of a sudden, lust is transformed into love. And despair dissolves and joy starts to bubble up. As we keep in step with the Spirit, insecurity becomes peace. Frustration surrenders to patience. Instead of anger, we have self-control. And I need that one especially with my children. So we walk with the Spirit. That's the first way we have fellowship with Him. We walk with Him. And the second way we have fellowship with the Spirit is that we keep short accounts. Here's what I mean by this. In any relationship, this is significant, but I'm gonna use marriage because I'm a pro at screwing up, right? I'm gonna mess up. I'm gonna leave my... Hypothetically speaking, I'm gonna leave my clothes on the floor. Hypothetically speaking, I'm gonna leave the dishes on the counter, you know, or in the sink, like 12 inches from the dishwasher. You know, hypothetically speaking, I'm gonna say something thoughtless and hurtful. I'm gonna make a self-absorbed decision. And those things are gonna be hurtful to my wife. They're gonna affect our relationship, right? I mean, you've been there. You know what I'm talking about. These things affect the relationship. And I might start to feel a little distance from my wife, maybe a little draftiness even. I would be tempted to avoid her because I know I've offended her and, and maybe I don't wanna face that. I might even start to create my own defense or excuse myself or maybe even try to turn it back on her somehow. And all the while, I'm running up a pretty large bill. I'm just running up the tab. Or, I can pay attention to what's going on in our relationship and I can quickly own my mistake. I can own my sin. I can ask her for forgiveness and we can, we can clear my account. See, the apostle Paul warns us with these words in Ephesians 4, 30. 
He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. When you and I choose not to follow the Spirit, but to go our own way, that impacts our relationship with Him. It actually grieves the Spirit. Have you ever thought about that? It's such relational language. And you felt it before. Think about it in your relationships, kind of horizontally, when something comes between you and a friend or a child, and there's a sense of loss there. And the longer we wait to address it, the more distant we feel. And the more charges we make on that account, the deeper in debt we feel to the point where we just start to avoid the other person. I see this in my kids all the time when, they, when they've done something disobedient or disrespectful and they, they know they've grieved me. They know perhaps that they've disappointed me and they hide their face or they go and they hide in their room and they try to avoid me. And some of you are not enjoying the fellowship with the Spirit of God because you have grieved the Spirit. And instead of confessing and receiving the forgiveness that he wants to give, you've let guilt turn into shame. And now you're avoiding him. I love the way author and speaker Brene Brown distinguishes between guilt and shame. She says that guilt is feeling bad about something I've done. Shame is feeling bad about who I am as a person. And you know, it starts with a conviction like, oh, I messed up. But then the enemy of our souls, Satan himself creeps in and begins to speak lies to us and we begin to believe that, that we're actually a bad person. Not just we've done something bad, but I'm now a bad person. And then, and then we start to believe that and we think that God thinks that and then we try to avoid God when, when all along, if we would just turn to him, the gospel is right there for us. And it's right there at the end of that verse. Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So what he's saying is you can grieve the Spirit. You can do something that's gonna impact your relationship with him in a negative way, but he ain't going anywhere. He's not running off and leaving you. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Paul would say earlier in Ephesians 1 that the Spirit is a guarantee of your salvation a guarantee of your inheritance. So this is just what you would tell your child, what I've told my children. You know, what, what you did, it, it grieved me. It hurt to see the choice you made. But it doesn't change anything about your status as my child. And it changes nothing about my love for you. So let's deal with this now and let's be restored and let's get back to enjoying our relationship. Let's enjoy the fellowship that we have together. And that's the invitation here. When we blow it and we will blow it, when we sin and we will sin, when we grieve the spirit of God, keep a quick, keep a short account. Don't let that add up. Don't let that guilt turn into shame. Go right to him and confess Ask for his forgiveness, receive it, and begin to enjoy all that is in your relationship with him. And that leads us to the last thing that I'll say about the fellowship with the Holy Spirit today. So we walk with him, we keep short accounts with him, and we engage in conversation with him. Here's how one of you said it in your story this week. You said, also, I pray a lot more now. Like, I really talk to God. And I can remember so many times over the years hearing people say they heard from God and I never understood that. I never heard from God until I started praying. I mean, like actually talking to him and seeking him. And then one day it happened. I heard from him. Like I knew it was him and what he said was very specific. What's that person talking about? It's what Jesus said in John 10, 27. He said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. We can hear the voice of our savior. The spirit of God is speaking to us. Are we listening? I know it's kind of freaky to say God spoke to me. You know, actress Lily Tomlin, you know, she worked nine to five. Maybe you know her. Uh, she said, why is it that when God when we talk to God, we're said to be praying, but when God talks to us, we're said to be schizophrenic. 
Part of the reason that we have not enjoyed the fellowship with the Spirit of God, and for some of us, that's the reason we've wandered around in a spiritual fog, going to church, trying to follow all the rules, but never feeling anything, never sensing the nearness and friendship of God, is because we have not been listening for his voice. We didn't even know we could do that. But he has been speaking to you. He's always speaking. And I bet that if we compared notes today, as people who are born again with the Spirit of God living in us, we would discover we're hearing from him more than we might think. So here's a little test. I want you to close your eyes for just a second. I want you to put your hands down in your, on your lap. I'm gonna ask you a question. And if the answer is yes, I want you to just stick out one finger. You're gonna keep tabs on how many fingers you've got stuck out at the end of this little test. First question, did God speak to you and draw you to himself when you became a Christian? If the answer is yes, just stick a finger out. Number two, have you ever heard God speak to you when you were reading the Bible? Number three, has God ever spoken to your heart through a sermon, through a pastor or a teacher? better put one out right here. Just kidding. Has God ever spoken to your heart through worship? Maybe it was a song or a word or a phrase as you sung it, it stuck out and you knew God was speaking to you. Has God ever spoken to you about an issue that you needed to make right with another person? Has God ever encouraged you after you did something that he prompted to do, you to do and you felt that sense of satisfaction and pleasure with God? Has God ever put someone on your heart to pray for? Have you ever been out in creation, out in nature, and you were just so captivated by God's bigness and his creativity and you just, you sensed his presence in that? Has God ever given you direction through a nudge or perhaps what felt like a still small voice? And number 10, has God ever spoken to you in a dream? All right, now open your eyes. Keep your fingers out. Keep your fingers out. If, if, you've, if you've got three yeses, three fingers sticking out, I want you to raise, raise your hand. If you've got at least three, at least three, I want you to raise your hand, okay? Raise your hand if you've got three fingers out. Keep them up. Five. Keep them up if you've got five. Six. Seven. Eight. Anybody have all ten? Several of you. God has been speaking to you. He's been speaking to us. We just might not have put that kind of vocabulary or language around it, but the Spirit of God is a speaking God. The question is, are we listening? How do we do this? Well, we ask him questions, just like you would build a relationship with anyone else in your life. You would ask questions. So let me ask you, like, when you talk to God, what are your prayers like? I mean, is it a, a running monologue where you kind of do all the talking and perhaps you end up kind of getting bored along the way? <laughs> Maybe it's the same phrases. You kind of throw them up every day before a meal or every night before bed and it's kind of become routine and you just sort of feel stuck there and you just sort of like, Why, what am I doing? This isn't fun. This isn't engaging. There's no real communion or fellowship there. Well, what if we started to practice what the Apostle Paul talks about in Ephesians 6 and we began to, to pray in the Spirit? What if we began to invite the Spirit of God to start to lead our prayers? We invite him to speak to us and then we start to listen for him to do that. What if we started asking more questions like these? God, what do you see in me that I need to see in myself? And then we listen. How do you want to spend time with me this week, God? Is there anything that's grieved you recently that you want to deal with right now? 
Would you search my heart and show me those things so that we can, we can clear the slate and enjoy relationship? Who needs to know you, see them this week, and how can I join you in that? What if we began to ask those questions, begin to listen for the responses of the Spirit, and then we went on that journey with him? So what? About a month ago, I was uh, at a retreat where we were spending some time in extended worship, asking the Lord to meet us and speak to us and, and guide us. And, and we, were, we were singing, and uh, I had my eyes closed, just kind of standing there trying to take it all in, wondering what God might have in store for me in this time of worship. And and then all of a sudden, something came into my mind that was so scary to me that I knew it had to have been God. There was no way I would have come up with this idea. And here's what it was. God told me to go and pick up, there were these flags laying out on the, on the, the stage and they all had these different colors and they were just were ex- tools to express worship and and each of the colors can sometimes represent things. We see this all throughout the Old Testament, especially flags and banners and what they mean. And, and, and I just felt the Spirit of the Lord so strongly say, go pick up one of those flags and I want you to start waving it. And I'm thinking in front of all the hundreds of people. And not only to do that, but to actually wave it over some specific dude's head. And I'm like, no, no, you know, and, and I, I fought God for two whole songs and I'm starting to get nervous. I'm sweating. Like I'm totally distracted at this point because I'm, I'm just thinking like, when am I going to do this? When am I going to do You felt that kind of pit in your stomach. You're like, I know God's told me to do something. Am I going to do it? You know, that's what they say. Like faith is, it's just like a foot in the air and you just don't know, you know, like, am I going to go? Am I going to, if I take that step, will he be there and will he meet me in that? And I continued to fight him and then I started to worry that the songs were gonna be over and then I was gonna disobey God. And then I had this sense in my spirit, the spirit of God within me. He said, it's okay. It's okay if you don't do that. There's no condemnation, John. We'll just stay right here. And I thought that was so sweet. But here was the thing. Immediately in my heart, I was thinking, but I don't want to stay here. I don't want to stay here. I want to take that step. I want to trust God. I want to be pulled out of sort of the rut of my routine, you know, sort of the the prison of my comfort zone. Like I wanted to step out in that. I didn't want to stay there. And so so even though God was saying, it's okay, we'll, uh, we'll just stay right here. I was like, no, we're going. And I went and I picked up that flag and I closed my eyes so that I could pretend like, you know, if I can't see them, they can't see me. You know, like, like I was so my kids, you know, hiding behind a tree right now. And, and I just, I just, you know, st- started waving this little flag and, and the guy was over here that I, he, God wanted me to pray for. I knew some, he was going through some hard stuff and I, it's kind of like, you know, one of these things. But, but as, the, as the song kept going, I started to feel the pleasure of God. I started to realize that I was being obedient to him. And and I think what I was experiencing was the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And so before that song was over, I was, and I was praying for just peace and life to come over this man, this friend of mine that I knew was struggling. And I was sensing, I was was joining in with God and what he was doing. And we were on an epic adventure together. And I just tell you that story because that's what I want for you. I want to have a story with God, a shared experience with him so that I can look at Jesus one day and go, you remember that time when you told me to do that thing and I was scared to death to do it, but then you gave me the courage and I stepped out and and I did it. That was awesome. And he'll say, it was. It was awesome. That's the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And that's what he's inviting us into.